Testing, testing. Can you hear me out there? Testing, testing. Can you hear me out there? Hey, okay. We are in business. Let me see here. If you're out there, let me know who you are and where you are in the chat area and um, what you are having for lunch because we are about to have a lunch breakthrough. Welcome, welcome to Frameworks for Freedom, my brand new show. Uh, we're going to get started in just a minute. Got to give Facebook some time to let the audience build up. That doesn't mean you should be late though, so I'm glad that you're here. Early bird does get the worm. Um, I can see your post over here, so I'm watching you. So go ahead and comment. Let me know who is in the building, who is in the room. Thank you again for being here. We're going to be going live every Tuesday and Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, again, this is Frameworks for Freedom. My name is Julian Gordon, and I am your host. If you haven't already done so, go to freeme.tv, and uh, there you will find uh, your free copies of two freedom tools that will help you. One, the Entrepreneur Year Plan. The other one is the New Year Guide. The Entrepreneur Year Plan is for anybody who's looking to start a business or has a business and wants to build it uh, and accelerate the growth and lay out a vision for the upcoming year. A lot of entrepreneurs start out and they just wing it from day to day without any strategic plan. We have to stop thinking like coaches and consultants and start thinking like CEOs. And that's not just for entrepreneurs, that's for everybody. And then there's the New Year Guide, which is an annual planning tool that I created to help you lay out your vision for your uh, life, your personal life. What do you actually want? That's like the hardest question for people to answer. And so that tool is there for you as well. Um, it's hard to get free if we don't know what we're trying to get free to or toward, right? So make sure you step over there and get, get it at freeme.tv. Cool. Hi, Tangela. How are you? Representing Milwaukee. Human. What's going on, brother? Uh, home with the flu. Okay, well, I hope that this, uh, this show is healing for you. Ginger, how you doing? What's going on? Good, good. This is great. I'm going to give the audience a second to build... Um, if uh, you know that this is going to be dope, uh, go ahead and share it now. If not, uh, if you find that you are empowered by it during, go ahead and sh share it then. And if you want to wait and see what this is all about, then go ahead and share it after. Um, we're up against some algorithms online, Facebook algorithms, YouTube algorithms. But uh, <coughs> through you sharing, we'll be able to get the word out, this powerful message that I'm going to be sharing with you every Tuesday and Thursday at 12.30 Eastern Standard Time. You know, there's a lot of people out there who are making a lot of money who don't feel free enough to take lunch. <laughs> like they work through lunch or they eat lunch at their desk. This is time for you to take a break and to rejuvenate, to heal, right? And so uh, we are going to go in. We're going to have some food for thought, food for your mind, and uh, food for freedom. That's the ultimate goal here uh, of this show. So I'm so glad that you were here. Hey, I'm Paro. How you doing? Good. So what I want to do really quickly is um, do a quick fill in the blank. Quick fill in the blank. So in the chat area, uh, in this fill in the blank, type in freedom looks like me doing what or being what. Freedom looks like what to you? You know, a lot of people have these vague ideas of what freedom, happiness, and success looks like. But if you had to have a specific image that represented freedom for you, what would you be doing? Who would you be with? Right? How would you be being? Would you be smiling? Would you be in a different place? Right? Would you be in a certain type of job? What does freedom look like for you? Right? And I want you to get very specific. Right? Nothing vague here. Not just saying enough money in the bank account. Give me an exact dollar figure. Eating at a certain restaurant. Being in a certain country. Right? Having lunch with your significant other. Right? A lot of people aren't free enough to actually have lunch with their significant other. Right? They don't have that freedom or they may be free, but their significant, significant other isn't free because they have a traditional job that is demanding and they can't even get off for lunch. Right. So what does freedom look like for you? And it can be simple. It can be picking up your kids from school and walking them to school. Right. What does freedom look like to you? So I'm, I'm checking it out in the chat. I want to see your answers there. Hey, no, Seasway, how are you? Good to see you. 
ginger, gardening in the morning, working a five hour day and learning new stuff and doing the arts and crafts in the evening, going hiking on weekends and traveling several times a year. Perfect, Ginger. That is so specific, so crystal clear. That's exactly what we want. And at the beginning of every show, we're going to start with this fill in the blank because a lot of people are out there hustling, running hard, and they don't know what they're hustling or running hard towards. And so once we get clear on these images of what freedom looks like for each one of us individually, right, there's no right answer. This is the only right answer is whatever is right for you. We can compare where your life is today and what you ultimately write here, and we can start making small little shifts mentally first, internally first, and then externally, right? We have to change the mind first and then uh, and manifest uh, on the outside and in the outer world, okay? Um, there's a quote that says, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? A lot of people transform everything around them, but they themselves haven't changed first, and so everything gravitates back to who they are. Um, somebody said, you don't get what you want, you get who you are. You don't get what you want, you get who you are. And so um, we want to get clear on who we are, and what we actually want, and then from there we can do the work necessary to actually manifest it. So we are here and we are live and I want to jump right in. We got a good audience here, some familiar faces. So it's so exciting to see you. Thank you for being here to support. Again, go ahead and share this if you know that it's going to be powerful. Share now if you like wow. Share during if you're learning and share after uh, or at the end if you have a friend who you know that this message will benefit. So let's jump right in to today's framework. <coughs> today's framework is, is really powerful. Um, and so first and foremost, I just want to welcome you to Frameworks for Freedom. Frameworks for Freedom is a brand new show that I decided to uh, create in order to help you uh, get to your goal, dream, vision, and ultimately freedom faster. You know, a lot of us are out there and we've um, done everything that we are supposed to be good, get good grades, go to good school, get a good job, make some good money. And even after doing all those things and checking off all those boxes as fast as we possibly could, I've noticed that a lot of my friends, including myself, didn't feel free. If you're like me, you did all that, you still didn't feel free. And so I was like, what is this? How do we actually get to the freedom that we truly desire without having to wait until retirement to get there? And so what has been powerful for me have been frameworks. Um, Frameworks are simply lenses through which you can look at your own life and they simplify your life. They help you understand who you are, why what has happened has happened, and what to do next. And some of the most famous frameworks out there include uh, Franklin Covey, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, you have five love languages, right? Um, you have things like the four agreements. <laughs> Excuse me, got a little bit of a cough. Um, these are frameworks that uh, people have adopted and and have really shaped how they look at their lives. You have Myers-Briggs, uh, what is it, the Enneagram. These are frameworks that people have created to help other people simplify their life and understand who they are, why they are, and what to do next. And I think in frameworks, I have tons of frameworks that I'm excited to share with you on the show. Um, and these frameworks are frameworks that have helped me shift towards freedom. Now, every framework uh, has a time limit, right? There may, like for instance, the food pyramid is a framework. A food pyramid may have been beneficial for me uh, when I was young, but if all of a sudden I want to have healthier foods and I want to take certain kind of foods that are not on the food that are on the food pyramid out of my diet, then I actually have to shift to another framework. So the most powerful thing about a framework is that its true intention is just to be helpful for who you are and where you are in the moment. But uh, sometimes we outgrow frameworks, and so I just want to share with you the frameworks that I've learned and I've discovered and I've created along my journey to move towards uh, more freedom. I'll tell you honestly, I am not rich, uh, but every day I feel freer and freer. And uh, I want that for all of y'all. I believe in freedom for all. And if you believe in freedom for all, uh, it's not a black or white thing. Freedom for all um, is possible. And if you believe that, then I consider you a fellow freedom finder. And, um, and uh, I welcome you to uh, this tribe. So again, we will be live on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1230 Eastern Standard Time. Um, for your lunch breakthrough. And um, you can get notified uh, by joining us uh, in our Facebook group. Um, if you go to freeme.tv, again, that's freeme.tv, put in your name and email address, that will send you over to our private Facebook group where you'll join a community of thousands of other freedom finders who are also on this quest and on this journey. But with that, let's get into this first episode to understand uh, this entrepreneur reality. Yes, that is the concept and the framework that I'm sharing with you today. It is called the entrepreneur reality. Entrepreneur reality. All right. So I'm going to write that here. Any comments? Entre. 
for new reality. Yes, the entrepreneur reality. We're going to start off this series with the context in which we are actually living in. We have to understand the context. And this is the context that we're living in. We're living in an entrepreneur reality. I don't care if you're an employee or you're an entrepreneur. The reality is, is that we are all already entrepreneurs. Okay, An employee is simply an entrepreneur who has one big client. And if that big client were to ever leave you, you'd be in trouble pretty fast, right? So in today's world, we're actually in an entrepreneur reality, and we need to be able to navigate that in order to get to our goals, dreams, visions, and ultimately freedom. And so I want to walk you through uh, a framework that I think will help you understand how we got here so that you can figure out what you need to do now in order to move forward and actually get more of the results and have more of the life that you truly desire. Is that cool? I'm going to check over here. Um, and see if there's any comments, any questions, any comments, any questions. Then I'm so glad you're here. The audience is building. Okay, great. So I'm going to jump right in. So what I want to share with you um, is how we got to this thing that I call and coined the entrepreneur reality. Okay. And so we're going to look at this in various periods. We're going to look at the game that was being played during that period, and then who wins that game. How do you position yourself to win that game? Now, I believe in win-win. I don't believe in uh, uh, win-lose situations. I'm always looking for the win-win. But if you are not prepared for this entrepreneur reality, it will be very hard for you to have the life that you truly desire, which I think is possible for everyone. Okay? And so the first th place that we want to start to, especially in the context of the United States, is actually... Um, a hard word to swallow, um, but it occurred. It's slavery through the Industrial Revolution. Okay, slavery through the Industrial Revolution. Okay, now this was about 1760 to 1830s, 40s, okay? <laughs> and what caused uh, this particular period, of course, slavery was a very malicious thing and people obviously weren't free in that particular situation. But it was really around the time that the cotton gin was invented that really um, uh, got the cotton economy going in the South and actually increased the need for slavery. So usually when we make these transitions um, from one reality to a the next, there's usually some sort of technology that causes the transition. And the cotton gin, which was invented in 1793, was really key to actually um, uh, keeping the slave trade going. Right. And so in the Industrial Revolution and during the times of slavery, you ask yourself, who uh, what was the actual game that we were playing? And the game that we were playing was simple. It was work longer, work longer. Whoever worked the longest would actually have some of the greatest results. And that work was based on man and his hands, right? Um, so women too, right? But work longer was the game. So if work longer was the actual game, then who wins that game? The person who wins that game was the person who put in the most hours, right? <laughs> Right? That was the game that was being played. And so this is why you had um, slaves. That, actually, they, they weren't slaves. They were enslaved, but they weren't slaves. Um, my people don't descend from slaves. We all descend from God, all of us. And uh, that they were called slaves. They were enslaved, but they were working long hours, right? From sun up to sun down. And that's how you won in that particular economy, that particular reality that existed in this, in this period, right? And... It's funny because if you look at the way we still work today, a lot of people are competing on hours. And I'm going to show you that there's an easier way for you to win in today's world based on the entrepreneur reality. OK, so <clears throat> the next next after that, right, came the second industrial revolution. Right. Second industrial revolution. And this is about 1870. To 1914. Um, what ended the Second Industrial Revolution was actually um, Henry Ford bringing in the assembly line around 1913. So the Second Industrial Revolution was like, okay, we maxed out. Everybody's working long hours because even here, in even here, most hours you had kids, you had uh, 
I think they said something along the lines of 18% of the workforce was actually under the age of 16. And this wasn't just black people who weren't being paid, right? This was actually child labor, right? So the old economy that we were in, there were children working in factories and in harsh conditions who were younger than 16. And that made up almost 20% of the actual economy because the people believed that whoever was able to put in the most hours and had the most bodies, had, had the most men working on a project, that's who won in that particular world. So then we shift to the second industrial revolution. And this is really around uh, who the game that was being played was work harder. Okay, we can all work 16 hour days, but who's actually going to work harder in those 16 hour days, right? And this is where manufacturing, so it wasn't just man anymore, it was manufacturing and machines, right? Manufacturing and machines come into play in the second industrial revolution. So Henry Ford, he increased the minimum wage to $5 and he saw huge productivity uh, results and huge financial results um, in terms of the value of Ford Motor Company. Um, but this was machines. Man still had to do the work, still had to use the hands, but it was being aided by machines. So who wins in that particular world where it's about working harder? The person who wins is the person who puts in the most effort the most effort, right? And so this is this is really key because we still, even today, still operate on who's putting in the most hours, who's sitting at their computer the longest, but we know that the person who's sitting at the computer the longest is actually probably the least efficient because efficiency is productivity divided by time. So if somebody is sitting, if somebody can do the same work in one hour that it takes somebody else to do 40 hours, the person who's there for 40 hours is not more valuable. They're not creating more value. The person who's most valuable is the person who can do the same amount of work in one hour, right? Uh, if you if you take, um, if you are driving from, I used to make this trip from Oakland to uh, LA, and when I went to school at UCLA, that trip um, normally takes anywhere from five and a half to six hours on average, but uh, I would push it, right? So I'd be pushing it and make it up there in four, four and a half hours. Um, Fortunately, didn't get any speeding tickets, right? Now, because the person who took six hours, do you say that the person who took six hours to get from Oakland to LA worked harder than the person who took four hours just because they took longer? No, right? It doesn't make absolutely any sense. The engine that was actually working the hardest was the one that actually got there in four hours. So a lot of employers and, um, and even entrepreneurs value their uh, themselves and um, and their talent by how many hours they're putting in, right? But it's not about hours, and it's not even about effort in today's world because you can actually put in a lot of effort, but if you're applying effort to the wrong thing, then you won't be getting the results that you truly desire, okay? And so this was the game that was being played, and it was really around working harder, um, and then around this time, the second industrial revolution, not only did, uh, not only did um, uh, the assembly line come into play, but also uh, mandatory elementary school came into play, right? Machines started taking jobs and uh, we knew that we needed to educate the workforce at a higher level. So education came into play and we went into the information age. The information age. Okay? And you're going to see how this relates to you in a second. So the information age, you start to get things like um, mandatory elementary school, uh, libraries start expanding so that people have access to information. And then on the back end of that, which we experienced, I remember Google came out when I was in, in college. And, you know, Google's mission is to make the world's information universally accessible to all people. Right. That was our older mission. I think it's the um, access information in one click now, but its old mission was to make the world's information universally accessible to all people. So the game that started being played in the information age, it was not about hours, it was not about effort, because if it was all about effort, then honestly, day laborers would be the most successful people in the country. They work harder than anybody, right? <laughs> so, but we know that that's not the, tr the truth. Uh, what we do know is that um, the hardest worker does not always win, but the winner does work hard. The hardest worker does not always win, but the winner does work hard. And so in the information age, what is the game? What is the game? Can anybody guess what the game is in the information age? The game in the information age is work smarter. How many heard that? Work smarter, right? So now we're talking about the mind. We're starting to get more and more white collar jobs, the mind and actually management, management, right? 
through education, you can elevate to levels of management. So let me just check in on you and make sure uh, everybody's good, can still hear me and see me. Okay, good. So a lot of people use this language, oh, I'm trying to work smarter and that's, that's good, right? Now, working smarter, uh, the way people talk about it, now some people talk about it in the context of life hacks or work hacks. How do I do this in a faster amount of time, right? But work, working smarter, really, the, who wins in this particular economy, in this reality, is the person who is the most educated. So that's why a lot of us went on to get edu education, right? Master's degrees, BAs, master's degrees, et cetera. You may be first generation to get BA uh, in your family, but it was the, based on the belief that more education would actually lead you to the life that you wanted. <laughs> and I speak at colleges all over the country, and I actually know that this is not a reality, that um, when I go to speak at colleges like West Virginia, where there are white uh, first generation college students, which I know for people in urban neighborhoods, that's kind of hard to understand, right? We think that all uh, people, uh, uh, particularly white people, have gone to college, and that's not a reality. Have you been to Boise, Idaho? I was in Boise, Idaho, speaking at Boise State, and I got off the airplane, and and um, I was in the car, and uh, I saw a lot of stray dogs, and I asked the driver, um, why, uh, why are there so many stray dogs? And he said, because people couldn't afford to keep them as pets anymore. Right? And this was around the time, uh, right after uh, the economy had crashed. Right? And, you know, in those kind of places, they uh, all the cleaning people in terms of the hotel, they were white. And so when I'm talking about freedom, I'm not talking about a black or white thing. There are people who have millions of dollars who uh, I, I'm in a connection with who don't feel free. So this is not a black or white thing. This is not an income thing. Freedom is something that I believe we all have access to because there are people who have less than you who feel more free than you. There are people who have less than you who feel more free than you, right? And myself included. Again, when I say you, I am included in that. So we have this particular information. We, we are transitioning out of this information age, right? Because now everybody, if Google's mission is to make the world's information universally accessible to all people, now everybody has access to the same information at the same time. So it used to be that if you had an AOL dial-up disk, right, with 5,000 minutes on it, you had access to information faster than other people. Growing up, I had an Encyclopedia Britannica set at home. So with that Encyclopedia Britannica set, um, if I had a book report to do in high school, I could run downstairs, reference the, uh, reference the report, and then turn it, uh, reference the book, and then turn in my report the next day. All my friends who didn't have an Encyclopedia set at home had to do what? They had to go to a library. So I had an advantage because I had access to information faster than they did. Okay, are you catching this? So now where we're transitioning is into this entrepreneur reality. And I want you to be ready for this reality. So if we're in this entrepreneur reality, the question is what is the game that we're actually playing in this entrepreneur reality? What is the game that is being played in this entrepreneurial reality? Can anybody guess? Let me see if I can see your comments. Let's see. See your comments. Can anybody guess what is the game that we are playing in this entrepreneurial reality? Again, if you came in late, um, in this entrepreneurial reality, you have to realize the reality is that we're all already entrepreneurs, right? An employee is simply an entrepreneur with one big client, right? They put all their eggs in one basket, whereas entrepreneur, uh, other types of entrepreneurs, um, they're usually out there seeking different clients. They're diversifying their income and revenue sources through many different clients, whereas an employee is an entrepreneur, but they only have one big client. An employee is selling their skills and their time to one particular client at a time, right? And so I want you to start to see yourself as an entrepreneur, even if you haven't started a company. So I'm trying to see, uh, use Facebook here to understand uh, actually to see your comments I want to interact with you for some reason it's not showing me so uh, hopefully I'll be able to get back to them in a second all right this is our first time using all of this technology and so we're figuring it out so in this entrepreneur reality who actually wins right because if you look at the economy um, in 2013 the economy was 61 percent blue collar and 39 percent white collar so this is a shift. Now there are about 53 million freelancers in the United States, and not all full-time, 
but some people who are making money on the side. So people are starting to shift into this consciousness and this awareness that they are already entrepreneurs, that I have the capability and possibility within me to earn income or earn revenues from anyone, my employer and beyond, right? Before work, after work, on the side, passive income, right? So we're all starting to see ourselves as entrepreneurs. And if you haven't caught up to there, you're going to be left behind. You're going to see who wins in this particular economy. <clears throat> so who wins in this economy? We had work longer. What is the game? Work longer, work harder, work smarter. Do I want you to do all those things? Yes, right? But who wins in this economy that we are evolving into? You get, you, this one's going to catch you off guard, okay? I'm just going to let you know. Who wins in this economy? The person who works softer. I'm just going to pause and let that one sit for a second. The person who worked softer. <laughs> Julian, what the heck does that mean? What the heck does working softer mean, right? It's the opposite of working harder. You mean be lazy? No, I don't mean being lazy. Here's how I define it. The person who finds the easiest way to get the right work done. Working softer means finding the easiest way to get the right work done done. I'm going to repeat that one more time. Working softer is finding the easiest way to get the right work done. Now let me break this down to you a little bit more. Working softer, when you're working softer, one, you are extremely passionate about the work that you do. So it doesn't even feel like hard work. Hard work usually happens when you're doing something that you don't want to do. Yes, when you're building your capacity and your skill set, yes, there is hard things that you have to go through but the work itself isn't hard because you actually love it you're passionate about it right a lot of people are out there and they get great at things that they hate they get great at things that they hate and what happens when you get great at something you hate you end up attracting more of what you hate <laughs> so if you have the capacity to get great at whatever it is that you want to get great at why not just focus on what you want rather than getting great at something that you don't want right so working softer has to do with internally you doing work that you love so much that it comes easy to you. It doesn't feel like hard work. The work that I do comes easy to me. It's natural. It's not against my nature. But a lot of people, um, when we come out of college, you know, these organizations, they see you as this big ball of clay and talent that they can shape and mold into whatever it is that they want. They want to send you over here to this little town over here to run their factory. Then you pack up your entire family. You shift your whole life for this company who isn't even loyal to you. Right. I like to say the 4040 club is closed. The idea of working for one company for 40 hours a week for 40 years is closed. It's done. Right. On top of this, when you look at how work has shifted, you know, I said 61 percent of the economy, about two thirds of the economy is blue collar. When a blue collar worker leaves work, guess what? They leave work. Their broom stays at work when they leave work. But for white collar workers, if work is connected to us via technology and our cell phones, work follows us around. So here's what I want here's what I want you to do after this show. I want you to take your annual salary and I want you to divide it not by a 40 hour work week. I want you to actually divide it by the number of hours you actually work. Right? If there's 200 work days in a year and you have the um, 40 hour work week, um, if there's 50 weeks in a year and you have a 40 hour work week, then that's 2000 hours. So you divide your salary by 2000, right? So basically, if you make $60,000 a year, you're actually charging your employer $30 an hour. $30 an hour. You make $100,000 a year, you're charging your employer $50 an hour, right? Whenever you sell something in bulk, right? When you go to Costco, when you sell something in bulk, what happens to the price? The price typically goes down. And so when you are allocating your time to one client and they're getting your time in bulk, what we often do is we give them a wholesale price. We give them a wholesale price. Now, here's the thing. As you start to get to six figures and beyond, it's no more 40-hour work week. <laughs> it's not a 40-hour work week. It's 50, 60. Don't forget to account for your commute, right? Unless you are working virtually, you got to account for your commute because the only reason you're commuting is to get to work. And you start dividing that number by a 60-hour work week when you really add it up. There are people who are making $100,000, but because of how much they're working, they're actually only charging their employer $20 an hour. Now, when you look at it like that and I ask you, can you go make $20 an hour doing something else? Yeah, you probably could with the amazing mind that you have. 
What I like to tell people is stop giving away your two cents when you have a gold mine. Stop giving away your two cents when you have a gold mine. Not gold mine, a gold mine. What you have up here is value. You ever heard somebody say, oh yeah, that's just my two cents. No, it's not your two cents. Most of you, if you really truly knew your value, you could charge $200 an hour. That's 10,000 times two cents. That's 10,000 times two cents. That's what you're truly worth. Never again say, that's just my two cents. Your thoughts and all the things that you've invested to create the mind that you have are extremely valuable. You are no longer giving two cents, right? You're actually giving value. So who wins in this economy that was about working softer? The person who creates the most value. I don't care what your education level was. I don't care what your effort was. I don't care how many hours you put into it, right? All that matters to the potential client, to the customer, to the individual who's ultimately going to pay you is, was this actually valuable to me? So again, work softer is the person, work, the person who works softer is the one who is able to find or create this easiest way to get the right work done. See, there's a lot of people out there who work hard and work long, but they're doing busy work, right? And the reason they're doing busy work is this law <coughs> that I'll share with you now. Um, I may do a separate video on it. It's called Parkinson's Law. And Parkinson's Law says that work expands the field space and time. Work expands the field space and time. So if I, um, if I give you two hours to take a test that only takes uh, 60 minutes, what happens? You end up taking 60 minutes to do that, I mean, uh, two hours to do that test. But if I give you 60 minutes to take the same test, you finish it in 60 minutes without compromising your results. So that extra hour is actually wasted time. The reality is, guess what? There's not always 40 hours of work to do every single week. But what we do is we create busy work. We start sending out emails, and those emails uh, create more work for other people. And again, working softer means finding the easiest way to get the right work done. <laughs> to get the right work done, right? So I know this concept is out there, it's completely counterintuitive, but the person who's going to win in this economy is that person. Now, and I'll show you an example of a company. Let's take Uber, for example. Uber said, what's the best way to build a transportation company? Now, you could go do it the hard way, which is go get capital, go buy a whole bunch of taxis, find drivers, and do all this other stuff. They said, no, we're going to find the easiest way to get the right work done. How about we let people use their own cars, right? Uh, um, give them a tool that allows them to find particular uh, people who want to ride to a particular des destination, and we go from there. Uber owns no taxis. So the traditional taxi company would have went and bought all this uh, physical capital, right? And what Uber said, we're going to focus on, a, on an app and a network to actually attract drivers and uh, riders. They found, the easier they found the easiest way to get the right work done. <laughs> right? So that's an example uh, of a company. Um, for me, in my college speaking business, um, we plant seeds in, in the winter for fall, right? We don't plant seeds in the fall when all of the speaking engagements actually take place, right? So I can put in the same amount of effort and work and work hard, long hours and everything in the fall. I can put in the same amount of effort in the winter from November to March. And November to March is actually going to yield more results than me putting in the same amount of effort and work from August to November. Why? Because that's when it's right. The same thing with gardening, right? You plant seeds at a certain time. There could be a farmer out there who's trying to plant seeds all year round, and you would look at the farmer and be like, you're crazy. It's not going to grow. It's snow outside. It's cold. Nothing's going to grow. But he's like, I got to work. I got to work. I got to do something, Right? And so they're planting seeds and they're not getting any harvest where if they would have focused on the time that is actually right and doing the right work at the right time, they would have been able to accomplish a greater yield without the same amount of effort in the hours. <laughs> so there's this narrative that's been sold to you that it's all about the hardest worker wins. No, the hardest worker does not always win, but the winner does work hard. Again, I'm not talking about being lazy here. I'm talking about finding out what is the right thing to do, when to step on the gas. You don't need to step on the gas all the time. Yes, there are people out there like Gary Vee who are just nonstop. And that is one narrative of, of success that you can pursue. But I want you to know that there's a flip side and there's a cost to working that hard. It means taking you away from family and people that you may actually care about. 
Now, your vision may be more enticing to you than the people that you say you love, and, and that's that's fine, right? But that's not the only brand of success that is out there, okay? So <laughs> with that, um, the question becomes, we're going to be in this entrepreneur reality, and I think we're going to be there. I think we're going to be here for quite some time, right? So let's just say that this entrepreneur reality is from 2010 uh, until 2060. I don't know what's going to come after this entrepreneur reality, but I do know that where we are right now is in this entrepreneur reality, and the people who are going to win are the people who work softer. Again, this is not about being lazy. It's, find, it's about finding the easiest way to get the right work done. If you look at any product that you bought, any service that you bought, what has it done for you? It has allowed you to have what you want easier. It has allowed you to have what you want easier, right? And so we have to think about what are we passionate about? What is natural? What is our nature? Where can I actually put in a good time, quality time, not just long hours for the sake of long hours, quality time and feel like it was nothing because it's what I love doing. Where is work? Where does work flow the easiest for me? If you've read any of Mahali Chikshet's Mahai's work on flow, you know, flow is uh, the same equivalent to being in the zone as an athlete, right? If you've read any of his work, flow state comes where the skill set and the challenge are equivalent, where the skill set and the challenge are, are both actually high. Um, and this is why flow uh, happens in like the fourth quarter for athletes. They practice all season for this moment. They're down by three with 10 seconds to go and flow occurs in this upper domain. It's a framework that I'll probably share with you later on. So that is what I had to share with you. Um, and I hope that this has been valuable. I hope that this has um, opened your mind to the reality that you're actually living in, the reality and the awareness that you are all already entrepreneurs and that the people who are gonna win in today's society are the people who actually do work that comes easy to them and that also makes life easier for other people. <laughs> the people who do the work that comes easiest and most natural to them and doing the right work that makes life or business easier for other people. Okay. So that's what I had to share. I'm going to try to jump over here into the comments. Ah, I see the comments moving now. See the comments moving now. This is great. Any questions? Any questions? Please go ahead and share this. Right? Share now if you're like, wow. Share during if you're learning. And share at the end if you know a friend who will benefit from this. Right? Hit the share button. Let's get this message out. It's free of charge and it's for your freedom and the freedom of those around you. Because freedom uh, is boring when you are free alone. I'll be, I'll be real with you. Freedom is boring when you are free alone. So you have to bring as many people as you possibly can with you. You were able to be here at 1230 today. Perhaps somebody um, that you know and care about was actually bound and could not be here uh, today. Please share it with them. Right? You can share it individually. You can post it on your wall and just pray and hope that it reaches the right person. But please hit that share button and send this, uh, send this out because somebody out there needs this right now to understand who they are, um, why they're in the situation that they're in, and what to do next. Any questions? Any questions? Would you still encourage us to complete degrees? <laughs> yes. Um, so know that you're going to... So the way I look at school, Brenda, is um, you're going to school to... Imagine that you're buying space and time, right? Rather than thinking about buying an education, imagine going to, to a four-year institution or to a two-year master program and saying, I'm buying two years of time, space and time, to actually grow myself. And I'm going to talk about the other 4.0 that matters in another episode, right? But that's what you go to school for. You go to school to grow the other 4.0, right? And just because you get a degree, just because you get this expensive piece of paper, doesn't mean that you've grown the other 4.0 while in school. So when I speak at colleges, that's how I reframe what college is all about for these young people, right? And it's not about just getting this expensive piece of paper with your university logo on it and a major. It's about what you did to get that piece of paper. That's the experience that's actually going to be the most valuable to you, not the paper in and of itself. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's an investment. It's an investment of time and energy. But it's very there, there's no other space right now where you can go, unless you're starting a company 
where somebody's going to give you money uh, or allow you to borrow money for a period of time without putting up any assets against it. College is the only um, one that I know that does that right now. Um, you might be able to get an investor to allow you to buy time for the development of your company, right? But uh, those are the only two spaces where you can actually buy time or get borrow borrow to get time. And so if you look at college or any higher education as that, say, okay, I just bought two years of time. I just bought four years of time. Now, what am I going to do? Not what is the school going to do? What am I going to do in this four years of space and time to grow myself so that I'm more valuable at the end of this four years of space and time or this two years of space and time than I was when I got here? Because that piece of paper alone isn't going to uh, guarantee I'm any more valuable. You stop most college graduates on stage at graduation, whether it's a master's degree or not, and you say, please lecture for one hour on what you just majored in or what you just got a degree in. And most people couldn't do it. You telling me you just study something for four years or you just got a master's degree in something for two years and you can't speak about it for one hour at graduation? See, a lot of people are going to buy a piece of paper and not to really grow themselves. And so that's how I look at uh, higher education. Great, great, great. I don't know why uh, Facebook hides these comments. Wish I could see everything. Any other questions? Um, Kenya, at what point does uh, that education or the cost of that loan exceed the value of the experience of college? I do believe that there will be a college bubble and that as these institutions continue to just try to rise, raise their prices over and over and over, at some point, um, the market will say, uh, no, we can't bear that. That's not sustainable. Um, there is no college right now that is dropping their cost. <laughs> um, and so at some point, there will be an education bubble or there will be somebody that uh, actually figures out this online learning thing. Because right now, online learning, only about 6 or 7% of people complete uh, online courses on their own um, using self-discipline because it's a limited resource. But as soon as somebody cracks that code, um, it's going to put all these brick-and-mortar institutions um, at risk. Again, it goes to soft work. This is somebody who creates an easier way to get the right work done, right? If somebody cracks that code in higher education, finds an easier way to get the right work done, right? To really train people for future work, then they're going to they're gonna create the most value and they're going to um, reap tons of rewards for that. <coughs> Any other questions? Um, the way I'm viewing this, I can only see... Uh, let me try this. The way I'm viewing this, I can only see uh, about three comments at a time. But we'll figure that out. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay, so I need your feedback. I need your feedback. Um, we have uh, this season one of Framework for Freedom is going to be eight episodes. So for the next four weeks, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 12.30 Eastern Standard Time, I will be here for you and your freedom. And so what I would love for you to help me do is vote right now on what should be the next episode. So I got a few that I want to share with you. One is the fourfold path to freedom. I definitely want to teach that this season, but um, type in the comments area if this is the next episode that you want. The six types of people in your life three to keep and three to let go. Um, the winners and losers in this entrepreneur reality. So if you love this concept of the entrepreneur reality, um, I will go into more detail. I have a framework that will go into more detail about what are the mentalities of the winners and the losers in this entrepreneur reality. How to train people how to treat you. How to train people how to treat you. I have a process for doing that. Um, it's called TRAIN. It's actually the acronym. Uh, five questions to get what you want. A lot of people don't know what they want. We know what we don't want, but most people don't know what they do want. How to ask for help. A lot of us out here trying to do it on our own, um, and asking for help is actually one of the most powerful things that you can do. <laughs> Seven ways to decrease the demand. Uh, life is increasing. The demand just keeps on increasing. It doesn't appear to be slowing down. The older you get, the more demand, 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 demand. Um, and this isn't just kids. This is work. This is taking care of parents, things of that nature. So how do you decrease the demand? Um, Five criteria for problems worth solving. If you're looking to start a business or you're an employee and you want to get promoted and, and uh, create more value uh, at your employer and be more entrepreneurial in that space, this is how you identify a problem that's actually worth solving, right? The right work. We talked about the right work. 
Um, the four ways to lead your legacy. Um, if you want to go a future, uh, envision the future, I can share with you the four ways to leave your legacy. And finally, the eight laws of soft work. Um, today I talked about working softer. This framework fits in the context of that. There are eight things to consider when you're trying to do the right work, and I can share those with you. So uh, go ahead and let me know um, in the comments area uh, which episode do you want me to do next. Um, uh, we will aggregate these. Me and my team will aggregate these and, um, and choose which one we do on Thursday. So go ahead and vote. Um, again, please share this. If you're like, wow, then share it now. If you're learning, go ahead and share it. And if you have a friend, please share this. Share this as widely as possible. This message has to get out. Uh, we all deserve freedom. Freedom is our birthright. Um, I truly believe that wholeheartedly. And, um, and that's why I've taken up this torch and this cause uh, to help smart, talented, amazing, hardworking people um, be more free. It's not about getting freedom. Freedom isn't a place that you get to. It's not external. You have to be free first in order to get free. If you have a slave mentality, even if you, uh, even if the doors are wide open to you, if there's infinite possibility presented to you, if your mentality is still that of a slave, then you don't access any of those possibilities. So you have to get free within first, right? And that's what frameworks do. They help shift and change our mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind first, and then the external world uh, will manifest what is actually occurring within you. <coughs> okay, so I see that the boats are in. This is beautiful. Um, I want to say thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm seeing the comments come through. And uh, I do have some homework for you, some quick homework. Uh, first and foremost, go to freeme.tv. That'll put you on the email list so that you get notified and you never miss an episode. Um, it'll, after you sign up, it'll also take you to uh, our private Facebook group so that you can join the conversation there. Um, that's where there's over 2,000 uh, freedom finders in that Facebook group. So go to freeme.tv. But one of the assignments that I want you to do to prepare for this entrepreneur uh, reality is go buy your domain name. Go buy your own domain name. In this particular economy, um, and to su succeed here, you do not need land to be free. Yes, I have land. I have land here in Brooklyn. I have land in New Orleans. And I want land in Oakland, right? But you do not need land. All you need is a landing page. You do not need land to be free today. What you need is a landing page. So go to GoDaddy.com and buy your domain name. Your first and your last name. It could just be your first name. Um, if somebody already has taken it, you might have to throw in your middle initial. You might have to do your first name with your last name initial. You might have to get .net or .org, right? Whatever you have to do, go figure out a combination and go buy your domain name. That is your online real estate. And from there, that is where we're going to position you to actually step into this entrepreneurial reality because now people know that they can come access you for the same services that you're selling to other people. They can access you directly, right? So that is my homework assignment for you is to go buy your own domain name um, and download the Entrepreneur Year Plan and the New Year Guide at freeme.tv, freeme.tv, all right? So <laughs> any final questions or thoughts? So look out for an email from me um, based on the votes for the next, um, the next uh, episode. Um, I'm excited to see what uh, you actually want. I want the show to be based on your needs and, and your desires because um, I'm here to serve you. So I can guess what you want, but um, it's better that you tell me. So uh, they're still here. You can still vote. Um, if you're watching this after the live session, um, feel free to vote as well. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel. And um, with that, I will see you on the next episode uh, on Thursday at 1230 Eastern Standard Time for our next Lunch Breakthrough. Uh, breakthrough. Again, this is Julian Gordon from Frameworks for Freedom, and I wish you all the best and more freedom. All right? <laughs> Much love, everybody. Peace.